Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom McNaught, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, and on behalf of Caroline Kennedy and our entire board of directors, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2012 John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award Ceremony. More importantly, I want to thank you for being here this morning to bear witness to the, our celebration of four Americans who represent the ideals of President Kennedy. President Kennedy, as you know, is admired as much for what he asked of us as what he did for us while he was in office. With the rights of American citizenship, he said, came responsibilities. And in his inaugural address, President Kennedy made it clear that in order for our democracy to work, it was incumbent upon all of us to ask what we could do to make it succeed. This Profile and Courage Award is a timeless tribute to the ideals of President John F. Kennedy in his belief that one person can make a difference and every one of us should try. And today we celebrate that legacy by honoring four courageous public servants, each of whom is a profile in courage. Please join in welcoming to the stage the recipients of this year's Profile in Courage Award, Marsha Turnus, David Baker, Michael Streit, and Robert Ford. <laughs> And now it is my pleasure to introduce Ken Feinberg, the chairman of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation's Board of Directors. Ken gives endlessly of his time and his many talents to our foundation, but just as importantly, to this country that we so love. Ken Feinberg. Thank you very much, Tom, and I thank everybody for being here today, and I thank you, Tom, for all you do for the foundation in this library. We are honored by your service. I want to welcome everybody here this morning. This is one of the great highlights of the year for this library. And we are honored by our recipients. And we are honored by the audience here today. And we thank you for being here to share what is truly a, an annual celebration. I want to note at the outset that there are wonderful people who are here on this stage today. Uh, I especially want to acknowledge the visionary who has, high, ha, has had his eye on the future of this library, working hard with me and the members of my board, along with Caroline, of course, to make this library relevant and accessible around the world, Ed Schlossberg. And I thank Ed for being here today. <laughs> now, my number one assignment here is to introduce family members of four recipients. Now, this is not easy. This is rather complicated. I would ask everybody, unless you want to be here till 3 p.m., hold your applause until we have all of the family members introduced, and then we can give them a rousing applause. I want to acknowledge on the stage Denny Drake, who is the husband of our recipients, a recipient, Amasha Turnus. Also on the stage is Sonia Streit, the wife of Michael Streit, and we have with us Janet Baker, uh, the wife of David Baker, in the audience today, because they couldn't all fit on the stage. We have very special guests. We have Elizabeth and Katie Baker, the daughters of David Baker. We have, I'm reading this, believe me. We have Whitney, Rob, and Brooklyn Drake, who are Masha Turnus's children. We have Ashton Strait, who is skipping school today. Uh, he's the son of Michael Strait. I want to extend a very special welcome to Ann Baker, who is David Baker's lovely mother, and to David Turnus, who is Masha Turnus's father. Stay with me. These are all critically important people to our recipients. Um, also, Ambassador Ford's wife, Allison Barkley, couldn't be with us today because she's on assignment in Africa. They are a foreign service family, and we're grateful for their joint service. But 
The ambassador's aunt is here, and I want to acknowledge her, Jay Breen. Thank you for being with us today. And there are many other family members here with us today, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, nieces. But I would ask all of you who I mentioned to please stand in the audience on the stage so we can acknowledge your great presence here today. Is there anyone left in Iowa today? <laughs> we have a very special guest worthy of special honor and a special attention. She was standing on this stage a year ago to receive the 2011 Profile and Courage Award, and she has come back today to support our honorees this year. Please give a warm round of applause to New Hanover County North Carolina School Board member, last year's recipient, Elizabeth Redenbaugh. We welcome our international guests uh, from Brazil, Canada, Israel, Korea, and Colombia. We offer a very special welcome to the many judges and other public officials who have made the journey from Iowa and elsewhere to join us in supporting our honorees. I do want to mention one name, the Honorable Patrick Murphy, the former Speaker of the Iowa House of Representatives. He and his wife, Terry, have traveled from Iowa to be with us today. Um, um, Speaker Murphy, would you please stand up with Terry? I also want to welcome a great friend of the library, the former Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the Honorable Margaret Marshall, and her former colleague, the Honorable John Graney. Would you stand, please? I think we have about 80 special guests with us today from Brown Middle School in Newton, Mass., and Norwell Middle School, young people who are here today to learn more about the legacy and principles of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Administration. Would you students stand up from Newton and Norwell? I want to acknowledge Jim Gardner, who is the Executive for Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries and Museum Services at the National Archives in Washington. We at the Kennedy Library here in Boston have a great partner in Jim and his colleagues at the National Archives. And of course, we gratefully acknowledge our own Tom Putnam, the director of the Kennedy Library, for the work Tom, Jim, the archives do uh, every day to make this world-class institution what it is. Tom, Jim, please stand. We thank you specifically. The Kennedy Library Foundation is fortunate to have an incredibly able, committed board of directors. We are joined today by several members of the board, Jim Brett, Randy Cooper, Heather Campion, Carrie Bell, Mary Reed. Will the board members of this great library foundation please stand? I almost forgot to mention Clive Palmer, who's come all the way from Australia. Thank you, Clive. A special thank you to our uh, executive director, Tom McNaught. Um, Tom, thank you for your years of, of dedicated service to this great institution, to your wonderful staff, for all the brilliant and tireless work uh, of the staff that make this institution and the foundation 
uh, the sparkling gem that it is. We salute you and your very able professionals. Thank you very, very much, Tom. <laughs> Finally, when it comes to the Profile and Courage Award and the work that begins year-round, the moment we're through today, we start over with next year's planning uh, to get ready for this annual day. I especially want to thank Ann Aaron, the director of the Profile and Courage Award program, and her great cohorts, Esther Cohn, who coordinates the high school essay contest, Rachel Floor, Karen Mullen, Elizabeth Fryman, each of whom play a major role in everything that is happening today. Ian and the staff, thank you very, very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the chairman of the Profile and Courage Award Committee, who leads the committee. Sometimes he follows, but he thinks he's leading. Uh, he leads the committee with great humor, great wisdom, and great political courage of his own. You should attend some of these meetings. <laughs> he has great political courage. Please join me in a round of applause for our chairman, our leader in this effort, Al Hunt. Imagine me leading this group. Um, it is my pleasure as the chairman of the Profile and Courage Award Committee to work with such a distinguished group of men and women in selecting the recipients each year. You cannot imagine a more inspiring or rewarding task than to sift through nominations of people with extraordinary courage and decide who's the most courageous. It really is just a, a wonderful experience every year. And there are several members of the committee who are here today, Ken Feinberg and Caroline Kennedy, uh, are up here on the stage. And in the audience, there are committee members Elaine Jones and David Shribman. I'd like to ask them to stand and accept our thanks for their service and participation. It's an honor to select the Profile and Courage Award winners. It's also a privilege, a privilege to select the winner of the Profile and Courage Essay Contest. This year, 2,078 high school students representing 50 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and the Marshall Islands submitted their own essays about political courage. There were two rigorous rounds of judging, and then the final selection was made by the Profile and Courage Committee uh, last March. Many of our essay contest judges are with us today and we invite you to stand now, if you would, as we recognize your invaluable service. I want to take a moment to express special thanks to the wonderful people of John Hancock Financial, which provides invaluable financial support to the Profile and Courage Essay Contest. We especially thank Hancock's senior director, Tom Crohan, and also Jasmine Cruz, both of whom are with us today. Tom, Jasmine, and their team have been true partners from the first day. Would you all stand? It's now a terrific pleasure to introduce the winner of the 2012 Profile and Courage Essay Contest for high school students. And uh, speaking for myself, and I think several other um, members of the committee have said this too, never have we had the caliber of entries that we had this year. So this is the best of the best. Uh, Patrick Riley is a junior at Archmere Academy in Claymont, Delaware, uh, Joe Biden's alma mater. Uh, he first participated in the 2011 Profile and Courage Essay Contest when he was a sophomore. He didn't win that year, but he learned something. And he came back this year with one of the best, best essays any of us have ever, ever seen. Patrick tracked down Russell Peterson, whose first act as governor of Delaware was to withdraw the National Guard from Wilmington. The Guard had been called in to stabilize the city when riots erupted following the assassination of Martin Luther King, Jr. 
As Patrick learned more about Governor Peterson, he was intrigued with the former DuPont executive's determination to pass a Coastal Zone Act. Peterson wanted to preserve the natural beauty and resources of Delaware's coastline, despite intense corporate and political pressure to encourage industrial development in the Delaware Bay. Governor Peterson's courageous actions resonate today as elected officials face difficult decisions about how to balance industrial development while preserving precious natural resources. Patrick, Patrick's essay really captures uh, the courage that Governor Peterson displayed back then, and it was an important and a rarely told story because one of the elected officials' actions, in this case the Coastal Zone Act, continues to protect Delaware's coastlines today. So it's with great pleasure that I present the citation accompanied by a monetary award of $10,000 to recognize Patrick's outstanding research and writing on the topic of leadership and courage as described by President Kennedy in Profiles in Courage. Patrick. Don't go too far, Patrick. <laughs> Patrick Prize, uh, Patrick's prize is comprised of a $5,000 cash award that will be matched by a $5,000 contribution to a John Hancock Freedom 529 college savings plan. Patrick is joined by his parents, Elaine and Michael, his brother, uh, Keelan, his sister, Melina, and his grandparents, Patrick and Margaret Riley. I hope they will all stand right now and be recognized. The Riley clan. Patrick Riley gets a John F. Kennedy Award. Boy, that's what it's all about, right? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'd like to take time to recognize the nominating teacher uh, of our essay contest winner. Every student who submits an essay is required to have a nominating teacher, an educator who provides guidance and support during the research and writing process. Nominating teachers play a central role in this contest. We rely on them to encourage students to participate in the contest and to guide them to submit thoughtful, compelling, and well-written essays. We all know how important teachers uh, are to us. Uh, one of our board members, David Shriman, actually wrote a book about 365 great teachers uh, that he, uh, uh, everybody uh, he knew told them who a teacher was that inspired him. And I think uh, we can add 366, uh, Patrick, with you today because t uh, Timothy Doherty, who was Patrick's nominating teacher, has been an educator for 30 years. He currently teaches two senior English electives each semester and serves as Archmere Academy's Director of Curriculum and Instruction. We are pleased to award Tim Doherty the John F. Kennedy Public Service Grant to encourage student leadership and civic engagement, and we are pleased to acknowledge the support that he provided to Patrick Riley. Can you come up, Tim? terrific and thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. We want to thank all the essay participants, their families, their teachers, the school administrators who made this year's program the most successful yet. And my final task is to introduce the guiding light of the award committee and of this institution. What can I say about Caroline Kennedy? What I can say is that those people who say when they get a call from Caroline Kennedy that they say, Caroline Kennedy's calling? My God, this is just awesome. And they get a little bit scared. Um, <laughs> she is every bit as awesome uh, as her reputation. She's also uh, a lot more fun. 
Uh, she is a delight. She is the guiding light here. She is the one that makes this such a special, special place. So it's with my great honor to introduce our leader, Caroline Kennedy. Thank you, Al. Thank you for not discussing baseball. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. This is a special day for the Kennedy Library, and I want to thank all of you for coming to share it with us, especially half the state of Iowa. <laughs> it's wonderful to have all of you here to support our honorees and honor the memory of my father. All my life, people have told me that President Kennedy changed their lives. They decided to join the Peace Corps, or run for office, volunteer in the inner city or outer space, because he asked them to serve our country and do what they could to make this a more just and peaceful world. The generation that he inspired changed this country, fighting for civil rights, women's rights, human rights, and disarmament. And they passed that inspiration down to their children and grandchildren. As the first truly modern president, he redefined America's timeless values for a global audience and recognized the power of each individual to make a difference. As we mark the 50th anniversary of his presidency, his time is becoming part of history rather than living memory, that his words, his example, and his spirit remain as vital as ever. At a time when young people often feel disconnected from politics, we need to reach across the generations and recommit ourselves and our country to these ideals. One way that we connect past and present is through the Profile and Courage Award. By honoring individuals who act on principle without regard for personal consequence, we honor the quality that my father most admired in public life. This is a special year for the Profile and Courage Award because we are fortunate to recognize four outstanding Americans who demonstrate how critically important it is that men and women of courage serve in all branches of government. The people we honor today say that they were surprised to learn that they had been chosen. They don't think they did anything special. They were just doing their job. But for public officials, just doing their job often demands a special kind of courage. Standing up for human rights requires courage. Serving the interests of all citizens, not just the majority, requires courage. As President Kennedy's ambassador to India, John Kenneth Galbraith once observed, it is far, far safer to be wrong with the majority than to be right alone. We owe a great debt to the four people we honor today for their courage and for the sacrifices that they and their families have made to secure a more just and peaceful future for all Americans. In 2009, in the landmark decision Varnum v. Bryan, the Iowa Supreme Court issued a unanimous decision holding that a statute limiting civil marriage to a union between a man and a woman violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Iowa State Constitution. Iowa Chief Justice Marsha Turnus and Justices David Baker and Michael Streit voted with their colleagues to make Iowa the third state and the first Midwestern state to allow gay marriage. The eloquent opinion states in part, civil marriage must be judged under our constitutional standards of equal protection and not under religious doctrines or the religious views of individuals. This approach does not disrespect or denigrate the religious views of many Iowans who may strongly believe in marriage as a dual gender union, but considers, as we must, only the constitutional rights of all people, as expressed by the promise of equal protection for all. We are not permitted to do less and would damage our Constitution immeasurably by trying to do more. In the final analysis, we give respect to the views of all Iowans on the issue of same-sex marriage, religious or otherwise, by giving respect to our constitutional principles. These principles require that the state recognize both opposite sex and same sex civil marriage. The decision of the Iowa Supreme Court sparked a political backlash. Nationally financed opponents of same sex marriage ran an expensive and divisive political campaign intended to intimidate judges and legislators who oppose their views both in Iowa and beyond. Under Iowa's system, highly qualified judges are appointed by the governor and then subject to a retention vote every eight years. 
The retention vote system is intended to provide a way to remove jurists who are unfit to serve, and the campaigns leading up to them have been characterized by the prevailing view that it is inappropriate, if not unethical, for sitting judges to engage in political electioneering. In November 19, 2010, despite their long and distinguished service to the state of Iowa, Marsha Turnus, David B Baker, and Michael Strait were ousted. They were the only three Supreme Court justices to stand for retention that year, and they are the only three judges in Iowa history to have been ousted in a routine retention vote. The justices were aware that they might pay a price even before they handed down their opinion, but they did not waver. In their decision, they wrote, a statute inconsistent with the Iowa Constitution must be declared void, even though it may be supported by strong and deep-seated traditional beliefs and popular opinion. In 1963, as civil rights demonstrations throughout the South met with increasingly violent opposition, President Kennedy said, we are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, and whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. Just as judges stood firm for civil rights 50 years ago, Marsha Turnus, David Baker, and Michael Streit, their colleagues on the Iowa Supreme Court, and dozens of other public servants across the country have put their own careers on the line to uphold the rule of law and extend the fundamental promise of equal rights. This award is usually given to elected officials in the legislative branch of government, but in honoring these three principal jurists we seek to remind all Americans of the importance of an independent judiciary and its role in safeguarding our most fundamental rights. We are fortunate to have with us today three other Iowa Supreme Court justices who voted with our honorees. Justices David Wiggins and Mark Hecht are here today, along with current Chief Justice Mark Cady, who wrote the landmark opinion. I would like to ask them to stand now and be recognized. And now I would like to ask David Baker, former Iowa Supreme Court Justice, to come forward and accept the 2012 Profile and Courage Award. I would like to begin by extending my sincere thanks to Carolyn Kennedy, to the members of the Profile and Courage Award Committee, and the members of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. I also want to thank my family and friends. I have a lot of them here. A lot of Iowa came today. Thank you for coming to Boston for this special moment. This morning I'd like to talk about Lady Justice. Portraying justice as a female fig figure dates back to the depictions of Themis and Justitia in ancient mythology. Themis, known for her right clear-sightedness, was the Greek goddess of justice. In Roman mythology, Justitia was the, go was the goddess of justice in that area. But since the 15th century, Lady Justice has been de depicted as blindfolded. This was designed to show that she was objective. She also held scales to depict impartiality. We made three choices that are relevant here, and I want to discuss how they relate to Lady Justice. The first was to become judges. The second, our decisions and our votes in the Barnum decision and third, our decisions in the 2010 election. Three of my proudest days were when I was sworn in as a judge in the state of Iowa. 
Like the symbols of Lady Justice, each of us took an oath wherein we swore that without fear, favor, affection, or hope of reward, we would administer justice equally to all. We also swore to uphold the constitutions of the United States and the state of Iowa. I tried to live up to that oath and do not regret my choice to become a judge, and I suspect neither do my fellow justices. Second, I want to discuss our votes in the decision. You've heard a little bit about the Varnum decision, and I'm not here to engage in a debate about the decision or its merits. I will candidly tell you that going into that case, I had no preconceived notions. I had my blindfold on. I frankly thought the state could advance some rational basis for the law, but upon hearing the evidence, it was clear they could not. And my vote was clear. Political or social pressures did not affect my vote, nor do I believe that they affected the vote of my fellow justices. There was no discussion along those lines, nor did it factor into the decision. The upcoming election was not a topic of conversation, although I'll have to admit it was probably in the back of everybody's minds. But I think this is how our founding fathers envisioned the role of the courts. Now the reaction to the Barnum decision came, of no, came as no surprise. We recognized there would be opposition, and of course there was. We were called activist judges, elitists, out of touch with the people, and frankly a lot worse. Now, court decisions every day are controversial. In fact, usually half of the people involved are upset with us. But without the power of the courts to declare acts of the legislature contrary to the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton said, the rights and privileges reserved to the people would amount to nothing. In addition, Hamilton recognized that an independent judiciary was necessary to guard the rights the individuals from the will of the majority. I had a couple of judges tell me from other states where they elect judges that candidly they believed our decision was right, but they could never vote that way because they would never win an election. That does not comport with the oath I took. I am comfortable with my vote on that case, and even had I known what was going to unfold, I would not have changed my vote. We fulfilled our roles as judges. Finally, we also had a choice to make in 2010 when we were faced with opposition. We recognized that the opposition would surface. We were not naive. It did not sneak up on us. We were permitted under our rules to form campaign committees. But the three of us up for retention made a deliberate decision. We discussed it, that we would not form campaign committees. Our founding fathers chose wisely not to have judges in a political position. Had we chosen to form campaign committees and actively campaigned, we would have tacitly admitted that we were what we claim not to be, politicians. <clears throat> we felt that we had to lead by example. We could have gone to attorneys or insurance companies or businesses to raise money, but we strongly believed that the people of Iowa did not want us raising money and being in that position. We were not going to endorse such a system for Iowa. No one appearing before a judge wants to have the feeling that the other side contributed to their campaign, and they did not. We fully understood that this course of action may not have been the smartest politically, but it was one that we believed in and stuck with, even though it may have cost us our jobs. The Founding Fathers recognized the critical importance of the independent judiciary, but many today do not want an independent judiciary. They want to take the blindfold off of Lady Justice and tip the scales of justice. They seek to have courts bend to political pressures. Why else were their contributions of almost $40 million in 2009 and 2010 in state judicial elections? Was this money meant spent to ensure a fair judiciary, or was it meant to curry favor and intimidate judges? Why would out-of-state organizations spend a million dollars in Iowa, which in Iowa is a lot of money? The campaign against us was not limited to us, 
but it was meant to intimidate judges and legislatures across the nation. That's why the outside money was there. They wanted to take the blindfold off and have every judge looking over their shoulder. The blindfold represents the notion that this fear should not exist. Lady Justice represents the ideal of a fair and impartial court, one that is blind to outside forces trying to in influence or intimidate courts, one that balances the interests of all. We cannot stand by and pretend that this was a perfect storm in Iowa or that it was just a local weather pattern. We must recognize that there is a climate change out there. It is a national issue. Remember Lady Justice and what she stands for. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, former Iowa Supreme Court Justice Michael Streit to come forward and accept his award. Thank you for having us here today on this very special day. I feel very honored and humbled by the Profiles in Courage Award, honored because of what this award stands for and what President Kennedy believed, principled governance for our country and its citizens. Humbled because we join award recipients who did their jobs with principle and in the national interest. It is very moving to be part of this award and honor an award that honors political courage, courage to challenge political leaders and interests. Our court will carry on, but only if we all step up with courage to say no to those special interests and moneyed interests. Our, co our court followed the rule of law, strongly believing in our Constitution which guarantees equality for all Iowa citizens. I am grateful for the role I played in this decision and for the award, for this award. Thank you to Carolyn and to the foundation and for this award. Thank you to everyone here today. Thank you for what you believe in. Thank you for the honor. Much of what this award stands for and what Caroline Kennedy and her family wished in establishing this award was suggested by Robert F. Kennedy when he spoke in Cape Town, South Africa in 1966, two years to the day before he won the California primary. He stated this, few people, few, few people will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice. He sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. He went on to say, few are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or greater intelligence, yet it is, one, it is the one essential vital quality for those who seek to change a world that yields most painfully to change. The future does not belong to those who are content with today, apathetic towards common problems and their fellow man alike, timid and fearful in the face of new ideas and bold projects. Rather, it will belong to those who can blend vision, reason, and courage in a personal commitment to the ideals and great enterprises 
of American society. It was almost 30 years before apartheid ended in South Africa after that speech. Right after our court filed the marriage equality case, five days later, the court received a handwritten letter. This letter really brought home to me what we did in our decision was right. The author stated after a few introductory remarks, too profane to read here, he said this, I defended the likes of you as an American soldier in World War II and Korea. I conclude I served the wrong side. Hitler treated queers the way they should be treated in the gas chamber. You are bastards. The emotion revealed was breathtaking. We cannot change such raw and intense feeling with nuanced discussion. This brought home to me what the gay community and families with gay members struggle with every day. It also satisfied me that we were right to resist political and expedient solutions to withstand the intimidation. People and forces exploited this fear, prejudice, and the paranoia reflected in the letter. They pressured our court to follow the will of the people, no matter how manipulated or orchestrated, no matter how it violates the basic human rights of being treated as equally as other citizens. Such forces must be challenged. My hope is that we will contribute a tiny ripple of hope and that this ripple builds a current that can sweep away such prejudice. The Profiles in Courage Award is made here in this beautiful structure at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. The library was designed by I.M. Pei, the same designer of part of the Des Moines Art Center. Pei said this, one has to persist. You have to identify the important things, press for them, and not give up. What our court did was to justly and honestly interpret the Iowa Constitution that guarantees equality for all. We did this as political forces, seen and unseen, swirled around us. We identified the important things, fair and impartial judging, equal protection for all, and press for them. Our acceptance of this award says that we will not give up we will push forward. We will persist. Thank you. It is now my great honor to ask former Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court, Marsha Turnus, to come forward. Thank you, Caroline, and a heartfelt thank you to the members of the Profile in Courage Award Committee. This award is very unexpected and one that I will cherish forever. My pleasure in receiving this award is magnified by the fact that so many of my family and friends have traveled to Boston to share this beautiful moment with me. Your presence here means so much to me. I want to thank you for the unwavering love and support you extended to me from the day we issued our decision in Varnum, through the dark days of the vindictive campaign against us, and in the 17 months since the voters of Iowa removed us from the Iowa Supreme Court for our decision in that case. Your love and friendship remind me every day that the most important things in life are not position or power. They are the people in one's life. And because of you, my life is filled with happiness. I mentioned that this honor was unexpected. It was unexpected because when we cast our votes in Varnum, we weren't thinking about being courageous. 
We knew that our decision would be unpopular with many people. And as David said, we even knew in the back of our minds that we could lose our jobs because of our votes in that case. But we took an oath of office in which, in which we promised to uphold the Iowa Constitution without fear, favor, or hope of reward. And that is what we did. The seven of us on the court had decided many years earlier that we would be a court with integrity, that we would decide cases fairly and impartially, and that our only allegiance was a commitment to the rule of law. Those principles made our decision in Varnum clear. Our founding fathers wisely created a government based on the rule of law, but the rule of law cannot exist without judicial independence. And when I speak of judicial independence in this context, I'm referring to a judiciary that makes decisions based on the fair and uniform application of law, independent of, free of, outside influence. I recently heard Justice Anthony Kennedy explain the concept of judicial independence, and he said judicial independence does not give judges the freedom to rule as they wish. It gives them the freedom to rule as they must. Judicial independence is certainly tested when a judge knows his or her decision is contrary to popular opinion and perhaps will lead to the voters holding the judge accountable in the next election for ignoring the voters' views. Nonetheless, judges cannot base their decisions on public opinion polls, on the wishes of past or potential campaign contributors, or on the judge's personal beliefs. Because when judges begin to do that, we cease to be a government based on law. But the preservation of our system of fair and impartial justice is not solely the responsibility of judges. There are, it is the responsibility of all citizens. There are forces in this country that seek to politicize the judiciary, so judges will be selected not on the basis of their neutrality and good character, but on the basis of their commitment to a particular ideology or to a certain view on specific issues. We must individually and collectively resist those efforts whether they take the form of corporate campaign contributions or threats by groups with political or social agendas. Citizens must demand that judges be chosen and retained for their professional competency, for their ability to be fair and impartial, and for their commitment to look at the facts and issues of each case and only then make up their mind on the outcome. An even more disturbing trend is the demonizing of judges and the increasing intimidation of the judiciary, both of which we experienced in Iowa. Public officials and other leaders resort to name calling and denigration rather than engaging in a civil discussion of the issues and constructive solutions. Calling judges activists or elitists adds nothing substantive to the public debate about the important concerns of our time. Instead, that type of bullying behavior weakens the ability of the courts to uphold the rule of law, to protect the social, political, economic, and civil rights of all citizens, not just those of the most vociferous, the most powerful, the most popular, or the most organized. At the end of the day, the debate about controversial court decisions and the judges who make them boils down to a simple question. What kind of court system do Americans want? A court system that issues rulings based on public opinion polls, campaign contributions, and political intimidation? Or a court system that issues impartial rulings based on the rule of law? If we as Americans value the rule of law, we must act as if we do. Efforts to intimidate the judiciary and to turn judges into politicians or theologians in robes undermine fair and impartial justice and will, over time, destroy the ability and willingness of judges to do their duty as faithful guardians of the Constitution. 
Only through an unwavering commitment to an independent judiciary can we assure future generations that they too will enjoy a society safeguarded by courts that uphold everyone's rights, liberties, and freedoms, a society governed by the rule of law. I'd like to thank the committee and Caroline for giving this issue uh, the opportunity to be heard, and I'm terribly honored to receive this award. Thank you very much. The public officials who made civil marriage possible for same-sex couples in Iowa are not the only ones who will tell you they were just doing their job. Ambassador Robert Ford will say the same thing. Robert Ford answered President Kennedy's call to service more than 30 years ago as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco, and he has been serving our country and the world ever since. As a career member of the United States Foreign Service and a fluent Arabic speaker, he has served in critical diplomatic positions in Turkey, Egypt, Cameroon, Iraq, Bahrain, and Algeria. 18 months ago, in a bid to encourage political reform in Syria, the United States dispatched Ambassador Ford to the Syrian Arab Republic to reestablish a diplomatic dialogue that had been corroded by years of tension. Ambassador Ford arrived in Damascus just when the glimmer of self-governance was sparking revolution across the Middle East. As oppressive governments tried to extinguish the flames of democracy with violence, the people of the Arab world laid down their lives for the promise of a better future. Robert Ford might have watched this unfold from the embassy. President Kennedy's observation, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable, is a prescient description of the Syrian situation. Yet Robert Ford advanced the American ideals of freedom and democracy against a brutal and oppressive dictatorship. As he became a pointed critic of the Syrian government, Ford himself became a target of violence. In Syria, Robert Ford did not remain silent. He walked through the streets listening to those who learned for freedom. He used modern tools of communication to give voice to Syrians seeking a more just and peaceful society. He put his own safety at risk every time he met with a dissident or attended the funeral of a protester. In all these ways, he redefined the role of American diplomacy and stood up for American ideals. But he will tell you he was just doing his job like many other courageous diplomats, including his wife who is serving in Kenya and cannot be with us today. This past February, the United States government closed its embassy and recalled Robert Ford to Washington, unable to assure, ensure his safety. As the Middle East glows with the promise and the perils of freedom, Robert Ford's public service is a tribute to my father's belief that one man of courage makes a majority. He has shown the impact that one person can have on the lives of millions and the obligation that each of us has to make a difference in this world. My father would have been especially pleased to see a former Peace Corps volunteer being honored in his name. I now ask Ambassador Robert Ford to come forward and accept the 2012 Profile and Courage Award. Carolyn, thank you very much. Uh, Ken, uh, Al, Ted, um, other members of the awards committee, my fellow awardees, David, Michael, and Marcia, and distinguished guests, it's a huge honor and it's very humbling to be with you today. I hardly deserve to be on the same list of profile encourage award recipients with great names in modern diplomatic history, names like Kofi Annan uh, and Weyl Ghanim and the people of Egypt, whom the awards committee recognized last year. So thank you very, very much. I will admit that I was shocked uh, when I learned about receiving this award. I had a phone message 
saying that Carolyn Kennedy had called and my office manager insisted it was the Carolyn Kennedy. And there was a phone number with a Massachusetts area code and I thought to myself, uh-oh, I bet she's gonna ask me about getting a tourist visa to Syria and I'm gonna have to convince her that now is not the time to visit Syria. Um, these are indeed difficult days in Syria. Uh, about 11,000 people have now been killed there, and we are seeing daily the kind of courage and the kind of commitment in cities and towns across Syria that are unparalleled in modern Middle Eastern history. In this, the second year of the Arab Spring, the second year of the Arab Spring, Syrians more than ever are demanding freedom and they are demanding dignity. And I wanna emphasize that word dignity. In Arabic, it is karama. Um, karama, dignity, is the essence of the aspirations of young Syrians now, and really, I think, the aspirations of young people across the Arab world. They no longer accept that security officers can kill and torture with impunity. They no longer accept that they must pay administrative officials bribes for even the simplest, most routine administrative functions like getting a license to have a, a peddler's cart to sell vegetables. Um, and they do not accept that the sons and the brothers of the top leadership are always above the law. Instead, I found in 2011 and in 2012 that Syrians demand respect and they demand that the boot of a vicious security state be removed from their necks. Uh, last July, I visited the Syrian city of Hama. It's a city of about a million people. Um, and I went up there without a suit and a tie. We kind of snuck in because the government didn't want me to go. Um, but it was a place where there were tens of thousands of people protesting, protesting peacefully. I mean, there was no violence. Um, and when I got up there, um, not dressed like this, uh, at first they didn't believe that I was the American ambassador. They kept saying, really, you? Um, and I think, frankly, they were expecting someone a little younger, probably with a little more hair, um, somebody that looked more like um, Johnny Depp or Brad Pitt. Um, and so disappointed but convinced that I was the American ambassador, um, dozens of people appeared almost out of nowhere. And they just went on transmit mode, and they started telling me story after story after story of abuse that they had suffered, that their families had suffered, that their friends had suffered, uh, their complaints about ill treatment at the hands of a capricious uh, government. Um, the people I met there in Hama, and people I met everywhere in Syria, more than anything else, just wanted to be heard. They wanted people from outside Syria to bear witness to what they had gone through. Uh, the Syrian government was just furious that I went up there, and they accused me of smuggling weapons to the protesters, and as I mentioned, the protests were very peaceful and there were no weapons. Um, we had gone up there specifically because it had been so peaceful, and the Syrian army was lining up outside the city um, and threatening to go in and crush the peaceful protests. About a week after my visit in these government accusations that I'd smuggled weapons up there, um, a video appeared on YouTube, and um, it showed this old white washing machine um, kind of the clunky kind my grandmother had with an agitator that turned very slowly and kind of made this kerchunk, kerchunk noise. And plopped on this old washing machine was a satellite TV dish. So as the agitator turned, so did the satellite TV dish, kerchunk, kerchunk. And um, there was a sign on it, and it said, gift, it's in Arabic, gift of the American ambassador to the people of Hama. And a voice came on on the video and said, uh, Ahmed, what is this? And Ahmed on the video replied, this is the secret gift from the American ambassador. And the first person said, well, okay, but looks great, but what is it? And Ahmed said, it is the latest American technology. It cost one fourth of the American budget. It can locate and destroy enemy jet aircraft, and the thing is chunk, kerchunk. It can locate and destroy enemy tanks, kerchunk, kerchunk. And at the end of the battle, 
it can wash your clothes. <laughs> um, I, I think about the people who made that video and the promise that all of the Middle East would have if there were more young people like that um, managing governments and taking greater responsibility. Um, so I went up there to demonstrate our strong support for the Syrians' right to peaceful freedom of expression and peaceful demonstrations. These are rights that are enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a document that the Syrian government itself signed in 1948. President Obama, last May, May of 2011, emphasized to all of us in the American administration working on transitions in the Arab world that it was our job to help those peoples achieve freedom, dignity, and respect for their basic human rights. And Secretary Hillary Clinton last November in a speech at the National Democratic Institute reaffirmed our commitment to support the efforts of the people in Syria and throughout the Middle East to secure respect for their fundamental human rights. And thus, I deeply appreciate the recognition by the committee today, but in fact, I was following the lead of President Obama and Secretary Clinton. And this is what my fellow Foreign Service colleagues do every day. In fact, I think that the vast majority of my colleagues would have done just about the same things I did had they been sitting at the desk of the American ambassador in Damascus. Foreign Service officers and specialists work every day, work every day to promote the respect of freedom of speech, of freedom of assembly, peaceful freedom of assembly, and of freedom of association. We are joined at the State Department by a superb professional cadre of political appointees, civil service employees, locally employed staff. I had wonderful Syrian staff at our embassy in Damascus, and contractors. All of these people dedicated to securing America's interests, including among those interests, advancing a set of universal human rights. My colleagues all know what John F. Kennedy knew, that our destiny, the destiny of the American people, is closely linked to the destiny of the people on the rest of the planet. I was especially lucky to work with a very dedicated, a very hardworking, a very brave team at the American Embassy in Damascus. In part, I understand the meaning of the profile of Encourage Award is that each person can make a difference. Those who receive it have in some manner restored a belief in politics and public service as a noble profession. I look back at the body of work President Kennedy left behind and that is enshrined around us today in this wonderful library. And then I think of all of the courageous Syrians who seek and really just want a chance, a chance to participate in an open and free political system. Marsha and David and Michael were talking about the importance of an independent judiciary and that is something Syrians would desperately like to have. President Kennedy paid the ultimate price for his service to our nation. Many Syrians also have paid the ultimate price in their trying to build a new country. It is my fervent wish that the violence in Syria will end as soon as possible, that the Bashar al-Assad regime will depart, and that a new Syrian nation will emerge and take its place in the international community. On behalf of my team at the American Embassy in Damascus, and on behalf of my colleagues in the Career Foreign Service and at the State Department, and all those who choose public service, as a noble endeavor, thank you very much for this award. Now, uh, the tough part of my job today, so let everybody be seated. First, we want to get a joint photo of all of our recipients of this year's award with Caroline. 
This is part of the, this is the obligatory picture. And while everybody stays seated while we have this award, uh, this picture, and then thank all everybody uh, for, their, uh, for their award this year. So why don't we have a, the recipients, the four recipients with Caroline, accepting their awards. Okay, everybody. Now I would ask everybody to please stay seated while uh, we all leave the podium here, but there will be a reception where all of you are invited at the pavilion right after, this, uh, right after we exit. I wanna thank all of you for coming here today. I wanna thank everybody here on the podium, our recipients, Caroline, and other guests, and we'll see you at the reception, and we'll see you here next year as well. Thank you all very much.